everyone and welcome to this episode of the Young Monks Podcast. Today we are going to be talking about making a maze solver in Python, uh, or more specifically we're going to be talking about um, making a program that finds the shortest path through a maze. So, I chose this topic sort of specifically so that we could talk about a specific algorithm called Dijkstra's Algorithm. Uh, let me just check if there's any questions yet. Okay, nothing. Youngwonks.com slash podcast for questions. Um, and the uh, this is the, pro the demo program I have to show how this works. I actually made this in eighth, eighth grade for a, like a final project for honors geometry to do with graph theory. We'll get to that in a second, what that is. So quite a lot of algorithms I'm in programming. Quite a lot of algorithms deal with this um, specific uh, this specific thing called um, graph theory, which is not a specific algorithm, but sort of a collection of them that deal with different ways of analyzing graphs. And I don't mean graphs as in x, y in the traditional sense that uh, we've used it before on here. I mean graphs as in a network of nodes connected by edges. That's obviously not a very good description, but uh, if you look up like a conceptual image of a graph, it's something like this. It's a bunch of locations called nodes uh, that are connected, by the way, they're also called vertices, uh, which are connected together by edges. Uh, in some graphs, the edges go both directions, and in some, they only go in one direction. So if you want to think of um, an actual real-world thing that could be represented by a graph, you might think of a city, which has lots of different locations, you know, blocks or, or buildings or addresses, which are linked up by roads. Some of the roads go both directions, in which case those would be edges that can go both directions. And some of the uh, roads are, you know, one direction only. And those would be directional edges like this. Now, the reason it's useful to turn problems into graph problems is that quite a lot of things can actually be represented this way. Uh, as I mentioned, you can turn like a map of a city or a country or something into a graph and then use graph theory algorithms to solve problems like what is the shortest route from A to B? That's how things like uh, you know Google Maps work. Uh, but you can also represent more abstract things as graphs. Um, the, if you guys recall when we at some point talked about um, writing your own programming language, we built something called an abstract syntax tree. That's a tree which is sort of a specialized kind of graph, and it represents the actual syntactic structure of a program. Now, what we want to look at here is whether anybody has submitted any questions yet? Nothing yet. Okay. Sorry, today is, yeah, Saturday. We have another right time. Yeah. Okay. Somebody send a thing saying that they're actually here because the YouTube thing is like not always in sync. So it just says there's nobody. Anyways, graph theory. The specific graph theory algorithm that I want to look at today is Dijkstra's algorithm. Dijkstra's algorithm, I don't know how you pronounce this guy's name. Very, very famous computer scientist who came up with this algorithm. I'm just showing the pseudocode here because this is what I used originally to write the program. Uh, that finds the shortest path between two nodes in a graph. So this is obviously used for a lot of kind of navigational tasks. It's not the most efficient algorithm, but it's fairly easy to understand uh, as a shortest path algorithm and it finds the shortest path. It doesn't find like a path that's close to the shortest path but take but takes less time to do it, which some other heuristic algorithms do. Now if we take a look at um, the animation of how the algorithm works, it basically starts at the start node, you know, that it's trying to find a path from, and it maps out um, the distances uh, from there to all the other nodes, tries essentially every path that it can and ends up with the shortest path. It is not the same thing as brute forcing the problem, like trying every, every path, but it is not very efficient. 
you can see it sort of explores out through the graph from the start until it reaches the end. Now, the way that I'm going to implement this, uh, oh, uh, next thing we should talk about though, is how do we apply um, graph theory to the concept of a maze? Well, this is actually uh, quite easy to do. So a maze is just a grid of cells, right? And some of them are black and some of them are white. White cells are passable, black cells are not. Uh, in this program, I just have it defined as a 2D array of like zeros and ones to be easy. Now, what we get from this is that um, certain uh, cells are connected and certain cells are not. For example, two white cells that are next to each other are connected, so we could represent those as two different vertices or nodes in a graph that have an edge between them. However, if you've got uh, you know two white cells with a black cell in between, they're not connected. So if we actually uh, you know take a look at any 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 given cell on here, uh, hang on, can you guys see my mouse? You cannot. Let me change the settings so that you can. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So if you look at this cell down here, the one I've got my mouse on, it has a connection to the cell above it, the cell to the right of it, the cell to the left of it, and the cell to the bottom of it. We're not going to allow diagonal movements in this. Now, if you look at this cell over here, the one that has a 12 on it that I'm moving my mouse over, it's connected to the cell below it, the cell to the right of it, the cell to the left of it, but not the cell on top of it, because that cell is blacked out, so it can't go there. So each cell uh, you can look at and uh, say which uh, other cells it connects or does not connect to. And so you end up building up a graph. Now you don't actually need to build a graph data structure in memory for your um, you know, uh, program to work like this. You can just store your maze as an array and then every time the graph theory algorithm needs to know which uh, nodes are connected to the current node, you just go to your array and take a look at the top, bottom, left, and right nodes around your node and check which ones are available to you know pass through. So if we go over to the actual demo program that I wrote, and we'll get we'll get into the algorithm itself in a second, you'll see that I have sorry, the code's a little messy, but this part is better. Uh, this function called neighboring cells. I called them cells here, not nodes, but it's the same thing, squares in the graph that uh, tells you which of the uh, nodes around your node are uh, considered neighbors. Neighbors are uh, ones that are accessible. Uh, the black cells that you can't pass through I called roadblocks and everything else I didn't really name. So you see the way that this works is it just um, adds the coordinates uh, of all above, below, left, and right cells to this array called neighbors, well, list, uh, and then it goes through and removes the ones that are blocked off or go off the edge of the screen. So anytime the algorithm actually needs to know what nodes connect to this node, it just goes here. In this way, we avoid actually having to build a whole graph data structure in memory, which is a topic we can talk about in another episode about graph theory in general and how you represent graphs. Again, any questions? Questions? Did you start your classes in MIT? No, I start on uh, Wednesday. Yeah, because Monday's a holiday, and then Tuesday is registration for everybody other than undergrads. I have already registered for classes, if you're curious. Uh, uh, they're all gone. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I'm taking uh, chem, uh, multivariable calculus. Uh, that's this one. Um, physics, electromagnetism, uh, PE sailing, uh, this random history class for uh, the humanities requirement. Yeah. Anyways, um, a wrong window. I was sailing in these today. Anyways, um, back to Dijkstra's algorithm. This is a pseudocode description of how the algorithm works. We're going to go through it step by step. First thing we do is we create a set um, of vertices called Q. 
So vertices are nodes in the graph. We're going to need to um, have a set of all of them that we then remove over time. A set, as you guys may or may not have used them in Python, is like a list, but it can't have duplicates. So if you ever uh, you know, just open up a Python shell and create a set like this, then uh, x dot append five, sorry, not that, x dot, uh, x dot add five. You'll see now it's got a five in it, but if I do x dot add six, now it's got a five and a six, but if I do x dot add five again, it's still only five and six. Uh, so sets are special in that way. If you add a duplicate element, it just doesn't get added. These are useful when you don't, you don't want to worry about there being duplicates. So you create your empty set uh, queue of uh, vertices. Now you go through every vertex in your entire graph. So if you have a, uh, you know, a graph like the one that's in our maze, you're just going to loop through the entire grid, you know, each row, each column. You're going to have a couple of dictionaries. Um, dist is a dictionary that stores the current distance from a given vertex back to the source vertex. Um, and we update this uh, whenever we find a shorter distance. That'll make sense in a moment. It's sort of a map of the minimum distance from each vertex in the graph back to the source vertex, the one where the path we're trying to find starts. So if we run our demo program, and we load a maze, and we run the program, you'll see that we have a little distance written on every single node. So the node right at the bottom is uh, the source. It's zero because the distance from the source to the source is zero. The node right above it, the distance is one. The node diagonal of it, the distance is two because to get there, you have to go up and then across. And then, you know, the node over here is a distance of 77 because the minimum number of uh, steps you have to take to get from the bottom up to there is 77 steps. So, let's continue talking about this. Hang on, let me check if there are any more questions. Nothing. All right, next thing you do, uh, you've got your array called dist, uh, sorry, you've got your dictionary called dist, where the keys are vertices in the graph and the um, values are uh, the distance from that vertex to the source. We start them all out with infinity as the distance because it's unknown. We also have a dictionary called prev, uh, where the keys are vertices and the um, values start out as undefined. The prev array is um, the previous node on the shortest path from the source to that vertex. So for example, if we looked at our little animation here, if we looked at this vertex over here, uh, then the shortest path from that vertex back to the source, which is the one right at the bottom, uh, is going to go through this vertex here. So that's the one that would be in prev. So for every vertex, you add the, ver the vertex to the set of vertices Q. Oh, and you set the distance in Q from the source to the source to zero, because obviously the distance from a vertex to itself is zero. Now, as long as the set Q is not empty, we're going to find the vertex in Q that has the minimum distance in the uh, distance uh, dictionary. So right at the start, that's just going to be any vertex, because they all just, sorry, no. Right at the start, that's going to be the source vertex, because the source vertex has distance zero, whereas all the other vertices have distance infinity. So we pick the source vertex as u. We take it out of q because we're processing it. Now we're going to go through every neighbor of u that is still in q. So take a look here. If we were starting at the source vertex here, we're going to get every neighbor, which is every node that connects to it. We're going to look at each one of them. And for each of those neighbors, we're going to calculate um, the uh, distance from the source to vertex u plus the distance from uh, vertex u to that neighbor of vertex u. Now, in our specific case here, 
the distances between two adjacent nodes is always just one because it's a grid. Uh, but sometimes you have graphs where the edges have different lengths. For example, if you are doing a map of streets, then some streets are longer or slower. But in our case, it's basically just going to be the distance from the source to you plus one. Now, if that distance, if that sum is less than the distance from the source to v, which is the neighboring node, then set the new shortest distance to v to that distance, and then set prev v to u. So what we're doing here is we're looking at every single neighbor of our node that we're examining. And we're saying, you know, is there uh, a shorter, do, um, does going through u get us to this node faster than however we were previously getting to this node? And if you keep doing this for every node, you eventually end up with the shortest paths to every node. Now, this gives you uh, a map like this showing the uh, distances, shortest distances um, from every node back to the source or from the source back to any node. Um, the, to actually find like the path between uh, the, the vertices we want, we just run this much smaller algorithm. You create an empty uh, sequence of nodes that's going to be your path. You start out with your target node. Um, if the if prev of your target is defined or it's the source, uh, while it's defined, you just keep following prev back. So remember, prev is the dictionary that tells you the vertex before this vertex in it in the shortest path. So if you had any given shortest path from say the vertex at the bottom to the vertex at the top, then if you start at the vertex at the top and go to prev of the vertex at the top, it's going to take you down to here down to here, down to here, down to here, down to here. You can follow prev of each successive node uh, all the way back to the start. It's a little bit confusing because basically what you're doing is you're uh, going to this dictionary prev, you're uh, putting in your key, the current vertex, and you're getting a new vertex out. Then you're going, using that vertex, you're going back into prev, using that as a key and getting another vertex out. And that ends up giving you a chain of vertices that is the shortest path from the end to the start. It's a little bit tricky to wrap your head around. I do actually recommend drawing out a small graph and kind of running this manually in your head with it. But if you sort of rigorously follow Wikipedia's pseudocode, you can implement the algorithm fairly easily to build something like this. Um, I will show you the Python, the actual Python, but you know, it's not particularly a special. It's just a pretty standard implementation of this algorithm. No fancy tricks. Here we go. So we do pretty much just verbatim. We've got Q here. I actually did it as a list because I don't add stuff to it if it's already in it. So I'm making it behave like a set. Doesn't really matter. I've got my distance dictionary and I'm um, running through it, following the exact steps laid out in the pseudocode, uh, building up this table of distances. And then we've got this part here that actually draws out the path that it finds. So if you run the program, you can load various mazes, and it will find the shortest path through them. That's all there is to it. Uh, this is a very brief introduction to Dijkstra's algorithm and graph theory. If these kinds of algorithms for finding like shortest paths and solving those kinds of problems interest you, please say, and we can talk about more graph theory stuff. How do you define infinity? Oh, uh, that's easy, just a really big number. So the only reason it's infinity is because you know how we do this uh, step where we say that uh, is the distance less than the current distance? For, for the nodes that we haven't like established a distance to yet, we want to make sure this is always true, that whatever distance we measure here is always going to be less than this one. So we just initialize them to infinity. So I just put like 100,000 or a, a billion or something, just a big number. It doesn't really matter as long as it's always going to be larger than uh, whatever number you're calculating here. Yeah. Uh, for floating point numbers, infinity is actually like a separate concept, but we're using integers here, I think, so it doesn't doesn't matter. 
thank you all for coming. Um, also, uh, send messages in the question oh, thing saying like that. when you would be interested if you are in doing a tour of MIT that is not like as bad video quality and audio quality as the one that I did on the podcast because I could do that at some point if you want. All right. Thank you all for coming. See ya.